morning, everybody. Good to have you with us today, and I hope that the things that I prepared to say will encourage you and help you. When I was a kid, there was a Bible class teacher in our church building that was at the the room that we met in as the little kids had a sandbox in it. Okay? And all you cross-eyed like that, I know that. I thought they caught that. But she would reenact in the sandbox with stick figures all of the Bible stories. And so we would all sit on the edge of the box like this. <laughs> little kids watching her tell the stories through the figures of the sandbox. <clears throat> and I don't know how she told the story that we're going to start with this morning. But every time I read that story, it amazes me. On the occasion that we think of as the transfiguration of Jesus, the Bible reads in Matthew chapter 17, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured in front of them. And his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Now, I don't know what she did. can't remember. I can't hardly remember yesterday. But I don't know what she did. But maybe she put the picture of Jesus up on a mountain of sand and... There he is talking with the disciples, and then suddenly a light shines. Maybe she did a flashlight down, and and then suddenly from the sky descends one who is Jesus. And, I I mean, from the light descends down, and then descending down with Jesus are two people, Moses and Elijah. Now realize that these were stick figures. We couldn't tell them all apart from one or the other. They were just different colors. But we probably would have sat there with our eyes big, bug-eyed and looking at it. But the three disciples of Jesus were stunned. Moses and Elijah were there. How did they know? I don't know how they knew by looking, though I suspect they knew by listening. A powerful way to learn, by the way. But Elijah was there. And if you were like me as a kid, you had a tendency to look at all of these people. Great Moses, you know. He's the mighty man who parted the Red Sea. And in the Bible class, we sing great songs about King David who toppled the, the giant. And, and then we talk about all of the prophets and all of the, and then we talk about the Apostle Paul and how great he was and all the things that he did. And as soon as we begin to elevate those people in that way, they lift out of the sandbox and they become people that we cannot reach. The Bible never wants you to do that. In fact, in our reading in James, read it one more time with me. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And usually that is our understanding of the whole paragraph. In fact, that's what James wants you to come away with is to understand the power of prayer. But my lesson is not about the power of prayer. Notice James uses in his exhortation to Christians an Old Testament man who is Elijah, who is at that moment of transfiguration, illuminated in a way before the disciples so that they would understand when God spoke from heaven, you need to listen to my son. Don't listen to the prophets Elijah. Don't listen to Moses the law. You need to listen to my son. James says this. 
Elijah was a human being just like you. He was just like you. I don't know about that. Think about the way that he looked. Now, when the text reads it this way, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 6, they replied, a, a man came to meet us and said, go back to the king who sent you and declare to him, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you're sending these men to inquire of Beelzebul, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you will not get up from your sick bed. You will certainly die. And the king asked them, well, what sort of man came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? They replied, a hairy man. With a leather belt around his waist, and he said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Well, I know the statistics, and that doesn't qualify to all of you. There again, my jokes still don't make any sense. When I'm <laughs> Not all of us are hairy. Though it's probable that when they said that, this is what he looked like. Because he's compared to John... In Matthew 3, verse 4, Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his weight, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So more than likely, these representatives of the king talking about Elijah were describing him not necessarily as a hairy man, because probably the only way you could know he's a hairy man, he wasn't wearing any clothes. Okay? <laughs> so I'm sure he was dressed in a hairy garment, just like John was. Y'all got a hairy garment in your closet? Mm -mm. In fact, I know very well when I was young, everybody, I had to dress the way everybody else dressed. Right? I wanted to look cool, hip. I was never cool or hip, but I wanted to look it at least, you know. <laughs> So we all dress things. In fact, you may, you may go to the store and buy the things that are on sale because I do that. I like to buy the things that are on sale, but I still want to look good, you know. John didn't care about that. In fact, he was dressed in such a way that everyone considered it laughable because he was dressed in like a prophet, everybody. Because there was a unique garb for the prophets. They wanted to stand out. They wanted to be heard. And they often looked marginalized and not normal. I guess that gives me as a preacher some hope that I don't have to look normal. I don't know that I'm human like that. But Elijah was. But something else. Was he really like you? He spoke out against the wickedness of Ahab. Now notice he didn't speak out against the wickedness of of Ahab because of how it affected his pocketbook or how it was going to destroy the economy. He spoke out about the wickedness of Ahab. That it didn't matter the economy or the effect it was going to have on his life. Elijah spoke out against the wickedness of Ahab. Are you like that? And he spoke out so much against it that in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, he told the king, it's not going to rain until I command it again. And for three years and six months, God will honor his words because he was God's prophet. Are you like that? Will you walk up to any political leader and tell them you're a wicked man because he's wicked with God and not because it affects your pocketbook? He challenged the Baal worship of his day. And, and this is a momentous moment for him because 
he has been pursued, challenging the false prophets of Jezebel, 1 Kings chapter 18. And as the record tells the story in chapter 18, there were 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. And he tells those prophets that, y'all just go make your sacrifice. (laughs) And you tell your gods to bring the fire down to light up those sacrifices. Baal was no god. Asherah was no god. And Elijah knew it. And he acted on what he knew about his God. God didn't give him the energy and the courage to do that. That was the kind of man Elijah was. And of course the rest of the story is is that the prophets dance around calling their gods to light the sacrifice. They do this till midday. Then they start slashing their hands and making a bloody mess trying to call down the gods to respond and <clears throat> Elijah says, you are a bunch of dummies. The Bible says he mocked them. And then he calls down the only God of heaven. And God sends fire, consumes the sacrifice after he had poured it and covered it with water. And God's fire licked up the water consumed the sacrifice and showed Israel who was the true God because Elijah was man enough to speak out against the wickedness of Ahab and challenge the bell worship of his day. Is that the kind of human you are? But he also fled for his life. After all of this happens, he's forced to flee to Beersheba in Judah. And in fact, he's going to become despondent when he's there. We have this perception when we lift all of our stick figures out of the sandbox into the sky that they're so wonderful that they never have bad days. Telling our children that if they have bad days, then they must not be Christians. Telling our new Christians that that if you slip up and you do something wrong, you're just not really committed to Jesus Christ. We don't tell people what it's really to be human. Elijah was a man just like you. His journey to Horeb to strengthen him also took him to Kays. To lift him up out of his despair. And he journeyed to heaven. I don't know about you. But I know that's, that's not the way I'm going to go to heaven. It's a hard, for, hard thing for me to look at all of that and say. Yeah Don you're just like Elijah. Can you? But that's what James says. He was a, had the human nature just like us. So what does all of that mean? Well, number one, it meant this. He knew the power of prayer. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the sky poured forth rain and the earth produced its fruit. Even James will begin his letter. Look in James chapter one. It's almost an intentional bookend on the exhortation of the letter. When he says in verse two, Consider it all great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. 
And that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Everyone, James is not telling Christians to ask for a miracle. He's asking you to pray and believe. And Elijah was a man with a nature like us because he knew that his dependence in life was not on himself, but on his God. It would not be Elijah who would consume that sacrifice with fire. It would not be Elijah who would drag himself out of the darkness of caves of his depression. It would be his God who would. And James tells every one of us as Christians, when you suffer any kind of difficulty, any kind of trial, don't blame God, turn to God. (laughs) Listen to yourself and realize Elijah knew what you feel. And Elijah turned to God because he knew the power of prayer. Even Jesus told the apostles, and we always make this point in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, that you know, he tells them that, that if you ask anything in my name, it will be given to you. And, and I realize that there are pray, prayer faith healers in our day who take that passage entirely out of context and make promises to people that are not true. But people. Jesus told the apostles to go out into the world and proclaim a message that was going to marginalize them and lead them to their death. Preach a message that had never been heard before. Preach a message to people who would laugh at them, mock them, and kill them. And you're telling me that they did not need to believe what they were doing. (laughs) And we have a hard time believing because we think our country is going down. Do you believe in the power of prayer? When James wrote about Elijah, a man just like you, he knew the power of prayer because of faith. He also knew the providence of God. I want you to open your Bible to chapter 17. We're not going to read it all, and I know y'all are grateful. But when we turn to chapter 17, Elijah is announcing the famine to which James refers And then as the announcement is made, the famine is coming. God sends Elijah out into the wilderness in a figure of speech to experience the famine. See, we have this idea sometimes that, well, I'm a Christian, so God's never going to let me go through a famine. Well, the word of the Lord came to him in verse 2. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide at the Wadi Sheriff when it enters the Jordan, and you are to drink from the Wadi. I've commanded the ravens to provide for you there. Hey, everybody, y'all know what a Wadi is. This is Arizona. <laughs> and what is starting? A drought. Oh, Don, go to the Wadi, you know, that seasonal river that never happens when there's a drought, and go drink water from there. Okay. That's like our kids... He's not here, so I can use him as an example. Daniel would always come into the house. Where's the food? Where it always is, Daniel. You know, the, the reason of our brains sometimes when our passions for hunger take over, we don't even think straight. Well, God was sending him to a wadi that would no longer have water. So he proceeded to do what the Lord commanded. Elijah left and lived at the wadi Shereth, where it ends, enters the Jordan. And the ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. When was the last time a raven brought you bread? When was the last time a raven brought you your meat? In fact, if your kids told you, Mama, I read in the Bible that God is going to give me bread and meat by a raven, you're gonna say, you'd probably tell your child, what you doing? And that's what he did. This was God's providence. Yes, it was a miracle. I'm not arguing that. It was providence. 
Elijah had to sit in a wadi during a famine where there is no water and wait for a bird to drop him bread and meat. God's not trying to teach anyone but the prophet that God provides. Then the Bible says, verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go up, go to Zarephath, that belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Look, I have commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. <clears throat> so Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. And when he arrived at the city gate, there was a widow gathering wood. And Elijah called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup and let me drink. And as she went to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Okay, everybody. There's a drought going on. And here's a widow. And here is a man who's much younger than her. He was not, he would not have been, well, I don't know how old she was. I, because she's a widow, I'm thinking she's old. I, I may be wrong about that. But here we, we're going to learn she has nothing. And here is this prophet walking and say, hey, give me your last piece of bread. Again, if your mama was standing next to you and you asked for that, she would have slapped your hand and said, don't you take away from that old lady who doesn't have anything but that last piece of bread. And so she said, verse 12, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked, only a handful of flour in the jar and a bit of oil in the jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks in order to go prepare for myself and my son so we can eat it and die. Did you hear what she said? Life is good. God is so wonderful and wonderful things are happening in my life. That's what she said, right? No, she said, I'm just going to go make the last meal that me and my son are going to eat and we're going to eat it and we're going to die. Listen to what Elijah says. Don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me. Afterward, you may make some for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The flour jar will not become empty and the oil jug will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. And so <clears throat> she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. And the woman, Elijah, and her household ate for many days. The flour jar did not become empty, and the oil jug did not run dry, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken through Elijah. Listen to your word from the Lord. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do so much more for you, O oh, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be pre provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Those are the words 
And Elijah heard. Those are the words Elijah said. Because those are the words Elijah believed. He saw the providence of God come right to him. And you're just as human as he can be. If you knew the commitment of faith like that. Like he did. Going back. Facing the adversaries of the Baal worshippers. Facing the adversaries of the king and the queen. Facing the adversaries of those Jews, his own fellow people who were telling him, God doesn't care about all of that. Are you willing to make the commitment to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the question. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? The question is not just merely, do you want to have your salvation in Jesus Christ? The real question is, do you want to be as human as Elijah was, who trusted in God for everything that he was? Because Jesus Christ is your answer to everything. Elijah approached all the people and said, how long are you going to struggle with the two choices? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. I'm going to tell everyone in this room. If you want more money in your bank account, follow money. But if you want Jesus Christ in your life, follow him. And he knew the challenge of discouragement. I don't even want to put a verse up there, but when he told the people, choose this day who you'll serve, like Joshua did, they said nothing. I can't tell you how real this is to me as a preacher. People I've talked to that I love An example of a couple that we just recently baptized, but they won't listen to the scripture as it relates to the Holy Spirit. And I continue to study with them and plead with them to listen to what the scripture is. But when I look in their face, they don't say anything back. It is discouraging to believe that when you're looking at people who say they love the Lord and they won't listen to the Lord. But I'm sure in this room... Those are people, some of you may be just like that. I don't know. And you need to realize that if you won't listen to what the Lord says in your life and follow what the Lord says, you are discouraging people. You are discouraging preachers. You're discouraging elders. You're discouraging deacons. And even more important than any of us, you're discouraging the weak Christian who needs you. Elijah knew what it was like to be human. To plead with people to listen that God is really all that. And for them just to look at him staring with a blank face, I ain't going to listen to you. But he knew where his hope was. Think of his life. He didn't drive a Mercedes. Nothing wrong with that. He didn't have 16 horses. Nothing wrong with that. (laughs) He didn't have much. But the life that he was called to, he willingly accepted because that's what God had called him to live. If you're a Christian in this room, you've been called to live a life. Not a life you get to choose. Not a life that lets you get comfortable with the way that you are. Not a life that allows you to to feel normal in society. God has called you to the life of serving Jesus Christ as a Christian. And Elijah knew that his only hope was God. 
Just as he knew that his only hope was when he told the king, it's not going to rain for three years and six months. Well, he told him, actually he says, it's not going to rain until I command it to. And Elijah was right. He knew his only hope for saving face is God's word. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. He persevered to the end of his life because it was the hope that he lived for. For us as Christians, of course, that means we live for a different hope, not a hope that's different in the sense just we know more about it, is what I'm trying to say. His hope was in his God, and our hope remains in our God. Our hope is in Christ. And notice when Paul finishes his big story about explaining resurrection, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, What am I saying, brothers and sisters? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption... Inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed, for this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. And when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruption and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dearly beloved brothers... Just keep doing what you're doing. Verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast. Be immovable. Be always excelling in the Lord's work. Because you know your labor is not in vain. The life and lessons of Elijah the Tishbite is truly a wonderful story. It is what James wanted us to capture when he reminds us about the prayer of a righteous man accomplishing much. It is because it is possible for you to be a righteous man even though you're human. Elijah was a righteous man just like you. Empowered with that truth does not make us heroes. And Elijah would not like you to take his little stick figure out of the sand into the sky. And none of you get to rise above the sand either, and nor do I. We get to be victors because of God. We get to be heroes because of God. We get to be saved because of God. So let me exhort you this morning. Do you know the power of prayer? Do you know the providence of God? Do you know the commitment of faith? Do you know the challenge of discouragement? Do you know the hope of the righteous? If you do, you know you have the Savior that you need. And you can pray and know that God hears and that He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and that He is the hope of the universe. Because He is the hope of mine. But this morning, if you need to become a Christian, We provide a song encouraging you to consider that the title of the song is Soul of Savior, You're Needing. 
And so if in this audience you need to become a Christian, the words of Jesus are quite clear. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. The vast majority of you are Christians. And remember Jesus' words to you. Don't worry. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. As together we stand and as we sing.